signed. This is the Northern Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Culture, Arts this and Leisure. I have to tell members that questions on. 3, 8 and 10 have been withdrawn. We will start with listed questions. I call Mr. Trevor Long. Mr. Long. Uh, question number one, Minister. Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you very much to the, to, to the member. In answer to your question, in 2013-2014, the target was to deliver 60 hours of Irish language content to a weekly audience of 25,000. The Ulster Scots Broadcast Forum aimed to deliver 12 hours of Ulster Scots programming to, to reach an audience target of 40,000 people per programme in the North. In the latest figures contained in Ofcom's Communications Market Report during 2013-14, programming supported by the Irish Language Broadcast Fund and the Ulster Scots Broadcast Fund and broadcast by BBC reached an audience of 660,000, representing just under 40% of the total of the North's population. And I believe this to demonstrate a continued demand for programming for both funds. Well, Mr. Lum for supplementary. Yes, thank you, and uh, thank the Minister for her answer. Um, would, would you agree with me that those figures will, will help the case for our negotiations with the Department of Culture, Media and Sport when they come to discuss refunding of these programmes? Um, absolutely. I would fully agree with the, the member, and I'm delighted to see that these figures have been independently supported by Ofcom. What they support is the, the experience thus far, particularly from both broadcasting and ice cream, but also from people within the creative industry sector who have returned to us that there's an increasing demand for work within both broadcast funds, which I think is a good thing, but this certainly will help my case when I will be going to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, not the, just this year, hoping to have further meeting uh, at the end of this year, but if not, certainly to be realised at the beginning of next year. And hopefully, with all the spokespeople before the next Westminster election, because it's important that we get cross-party support for this. Call Mr. Nelson McCausland. Um, the Minister put together there the figures for the uh, programmes through both broadcast funds. Um, could she either give us the figures separately for the two funds that in terms of viewers um, per programme? And uh, if not, could you send that on? But could you also ensure that when she is negotiating with uh, the Treasury or with DCMS in, uh, MS in London, that the funding for both broadcast funds is equalised so that we have the sort of equality that is real equality and not the Trojan horse of equality that was mentioned by her party leader last night in his efforts to break unionism, which he will fail to do, of course? Well, at least my party leader knows when to apologise. Um, certainly, but well, um, please, well, Minister, in relation, Minister, will you resume your seat, please? Mm -hmm. Members should know at this stage. I will not accept anyone making any remarks of any kind from a sedentary position, and I'm disappointed that it has happened again today, especially so soon in question time. Thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd certainly ensure that I lobby uh, not only to have the funds realised, but certainly do so on the basis of need. Now, if the member is telling me that there, there is the equality of demand and equality of evidence between the Irish language and Ulster Scots, I have yet to see that evidence. So what I'll do is I'll match funding to the basis of need. That has been my commitment. I have done it thus far. I don't cherry pick. I don't pick up my pet projects, I do it on the basis of need. So I'll happily negotiate for additional and secured funding, and certainly an uplift in the current funding on the basis of need. And I'll happily furnish the member for figures for each few and time for each of the programmes, because I think not only can the, the both broadcast agencies stand over those figures, they've been independently supported by Ofcom, and I'd be happy to share those with not just himself, certainly other members of the committee. Members, before I call the next speaker, I have to tell you that it is question 9 that was withdrawn and not question 10. I apologise for that. I now call Mrs Joanne Dobson for a question. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Thank the member for her question. Um, and as a member knows, responsibility for promoting hockey in the north of Ireland, including Lurgan and Portadown, rests with the governing body of sport, in this case, it's Ulster Hockey. And since 2011, Sport NI has provided Ulster Hockey with funding of almost £914,000 for the promotion and the development of hockey across the north. A further £551,000 has been invested in local hockey clubs and schools to deliver the sport within the local communities. Within this investment, a number of primary schools within the Lurgan and Portadown areas have received funding of almost £3,000 um, to deliver a range of sports to provide coaching for children across the sports, particularly in relation to hockey. And Sport NI is currently assessing applications received under its active awards for sport programme. This is the second round of the lottery-funded small grants programme, primarily aimed at grassroots community-based sports. Six hockey organisations, including two hockey clubs based in the Craig Avon Borough Council area, submitted applications. Sport and I will notify the applicants of the outcome in December of this year. Well, Mrs. Dobson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answer? And she will be aware that I met last month alongside Sport NI and DECAL officials with Lurgan Ladies Hockey Club and Killigamian Junior High School. And we are delighted that Killigamian Junior High School have since had their new pitch confirmed by the board. So can I ask what more can the Minister do to ensure more effective partnership working that delivers further good news story, stories for clubs and players in Portadown and Lurgan? Well, I think the member certainly has highlighted the fact that partnership is key, certainly around future provision, and particularly when we're looking at capital <coughs> needs of clubs, uh, in this case schools and councils. And we're certainly encouraging, uh, in the case of the, the, the member's own constituency, and certainly in the area that she highlighted, these people came together naturally because they have a good working relationship. They also see and uh, realised that the power of bringing both clubs and bringing clubs and schools together actually realised facilities, and that's what we're encouraging people to do. There is a big difficulty around, obviously, funding in the future, but it's not to say that where clubs and partnerships and schools pr provide uh, evidence of need, evidence of, of a good, effective partnership with the support of government body, I think it stands in good stead, and it's certainly the way we'd like to see future provision rolled out in the future. Call Mr. William Humphrey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister uh, uh, agree with me that it's important for young hockey players from Portadown and Lurgan, and indeed across all, uh, Northern Ireland's clubs, to be able to participate in the Commonwealth Games? And therefore, can I ask the Minister if she will encourage hockey, uh, Ulster Hockey to relax the regulations there to allow a Northern Ireland team to participate in future Commonwealth Games commencing in Gold Coast in 2018? Um, I have written to the, the governing body in this matter. I have received the correspondence. I haven't had an opportunity to read it yet or to disseminate it yet. But certainly this was raised with me in relation to hockey and won't be said at the last question time. And as I give a guarantee then, upon receipt of that correspondence, I'll happily share, I'll happily share it with a member. Call Mr Mickey Brady. Gorham, I got the last concordia. I thank the Minister for answers so far. Could the Minister provide an update on Sport ANA's new capital funding programme? Gorham, I got um, I thank the member for his question and in relation to the primary answer, the Sport NI is currently developing a capital programme which aims to invest £17.5 million of lottery funding in sports facilities over the next five years, which I am sure the member and other members will agree is substantial funding. This programme will seek to integrate the facility needs of community participants and certainly the performance of athletes within the same multi-sport environment. Sport NI has consulted with sports governing bodies to identify priorities for high-performing athletes going forward, and they have also spoken and have started working with in good partnerships with councils to deliver sports facility strategies, and they are also working with local cl clubs and communities. It is envisaged that this investment will be brought forward in the new year, but certainly at this stage it is important to finish that consultation so we get a robust uh, level of service needs um, within the communities, um, but certainly the small grants award will be made known soon, and then we we'll move on to the bigger capital programmes in the new year. 
Call Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what Intersport exchanges uh, her department encourages uh, to young people uh, to have the opportunity uh, to learn more about um, sports not traditionally known in their communities, i.e., the hockey, maybe playing camogie, and vice versa? I know the members um, has, uh, is aware of what's known now as a game of three halves, and that goes across soccer, Gaelic games, and rugby sometimes hockey and sometimes other sports in between. Uh, I think it's a good initiative. It exposes young people in particular to games that traditionally they normally wouldn't find themselves attracted to. It also brings forward an awareness, not just of the games, but at times a culture behind some of those games. And it's really important, I think, sports, certainly the governing bodies, but individuals within the clubs and indeed the schools have been very, very proactive and trying to make sure that there's every opportunity that children in particular can avail of these. Uh, and I do believe that particularly in relation to soccer, gilly games and rugby, the three governing bodies in particular, through the, the, the additional funding they've received in DECAL, have done a lot of work around this, not just to help people with physical and mental, uh, better, better physical and mental health, but certainly with the cultural awareness and cultural inclusion that these programmes bring. I'm sure the member will agree it's very important. Call Mr David McNary for a question. Uh, question four on the list. Thank the member for his question. The, the cost of staff at grade five and above in my department at the financial year 31st of March 2014 was £818,428. However, this figure includes the cost of temporary staff involved in special projects or dedicated projects. When these posts are excluded, the cost was £690,000. Uh, at the 31st of March 2014, permanent staff at Grade 5 and above comprised of five at Grade 5, including uh, one at Grade 3 and one permanent secretary. Well, Mr. McNary, for supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, just a couple of points uh, coming back. I would be indebted to the Minister. I do thank her for her answer. If she could maybe relate more to what the cost of 128,000, I reckon, was used on temporary staff and what they were doing. I wonder then, and I think the figure is high, um, has the minister uh, considered uh, sharing some specialist functions in her department, such as finance, um, with uh, other departments to save public money? Um, well, I'll happily uh, re relate that figure back and try and get the member the details and write to him personally. Um, the, the cost uh, in terms of the, the staff, I mean, I've certainly brought additional staff in to look at, particularly in the stadia development programmes, where it's, it's skilled, skilled uh, expertise that was needed in order to bring those programmes forward. In addition to that, I also work with the Strategic Investment Board to try and ensure that there's better provision, that I'm not having to buy in or contract additional work when there's already that service that I feel of. The member will also be aware that you pay for that. But certainly it's an expertise that so far I have found very valuable. In terms of sharing with finance and the rest of it, the member will also be aware that Dick Hald and its armed land bodies have a particular uh, financial need within my department to ensure that that money and indeed the governance and audit trails around it flow freely. So I would certainly would be reluctant to point out one area within the, the work and remit of Dick Hall that I'd be happy to look at. at. Currently at the minute I'm looking at everything. Call Mr. Patsy McGlow. I have got a last one for you. I guess we have slashed an era as the Friday and Nigga show. And just a little bit of case to can thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for her answers up until now. Uh, could I ask the Minister what a uptake of voluntary redundancy does she anticipate within her own department, and how that might be funded? Well, um, going by his uh, going by Slabala's case, Karim, I have no idea. That at this stage, in terms of any uh, figures in relation to voluntary redundancy. Uh, I mean, as a member will be aware, my uh, plans, <coughs> high level financial uh, budget plans, were, albeit provisional, were all put, put on the website last week. Uh, certainly, it's something that uh, the, the officials, with their staff site representatives, are working through, and I think it certainly does yet. I certainly anticipate the, the close of play in terms of the consultation and the draft budget that we might have more definitive <coughs> figures back. And if and when those figures are brought forward, I'd be happy to share them with them and indeed other members of the CAL committee. Mr. Michael McJimsey is not in his place. I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Question number six, please, Deputy Speaker. 
I thank the member for his question. I have met with representatives of the orchestra to explore the nature of the problems faced and the work it, it is undertaken to identify possible solutions. Officials from my department, together with the Arts Council, continue to engage with the orchestra and its sponsors to develop and refine potential operating models and alternative funding mechanisms, which would enable the orchestra to safeguard its future. If a new sustainable operating model emerges, I will give it serious consideration and subject to re receiving assurances that it can be delivered. It is only then I will engage with executive colleagues to assess how we as an executive might support it. Call Mr. Dunn for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answers? And I do welcome the Minister's recognition of the significance of the Ulster Orchestra in the culture the cultural life of Northern Ireland. Will the Minister give us an assurance that she will continue to drum up support for the Ulster Orchestra, subject to the production of a new operating mod model? I thank the member for his question, and I'm sure we'll hear some more um, uh, about the Ulster Orchestra throughout even today, but over the period of the next couple of days. As I said in my primary answer, I'm expecting uh, a revised business model to come back from the Ulster Orchestra uh, on the basis that that model can stand up to scrutiny. In fact, and what that means is, and I'm sure the member and other members have concern about this, that we aren't facing this problem year on and year, that it's going to withstand next year's budget, the year after that and the year after that. So providing that that uh, new revised model is brought forward and providing it has a full support, and it's only then that I can bring forward any proposal to my executive colleagues for support. I do value the work that the Ulster Orchestra do. I'm on the record of saying that. But at the minute, it's, it's unsustainable as it, in its current configuration. Call Mr. Basil McCree. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, are you expecting that revised plan today? And if so, when will you be in a position to evaluate it and come back and decide whether you can help? I'm expecting a revised plan by the end of the week, no later than Friday of this week, by the 28th. Uh, if you are under the impression I'm expecting it today, then you know more than my private office does. But sure, that wouldn't be a first puzzle, would it? Um, but certainly I'm expecting it by the end of this week, and certainly soon after, uh, I, I'd be working to see if we can meet the revised plan and certainly meet uh, with the orchestra and indeed with Arts Council, Belfast City Council and its other sponsors to see if we can get a model that suits everyone's needs. Well, Mr Nelson McCause. Um, th thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I welcome the fact that Belfast City Council has made the commitment of £100,000 towards the Ulster Orchestra. Um, I understand there were some comments today on the radio um, from Sir George Bain in regard to the provision of the business model. Uh, for, for the Ulster Orchestra, and hopefully, from what is said even here, that will be forthcoming very soon. Will the Minister give that clear undertaking that, in the event that that does arrive within the next few days, she will be very soon in a position with Arts Council to ensure that the additional funding to make up the shortfall on top of the 100,000 is met? Well, my understanding of I didn't hear any of the comments in the radio in relation to the orchestra, but my understanding was that the hundred thousand pounds that came from Belfast City Council was on condition that the ECALS funding came forward. Um, and my conditions are that if that, that revised model is robust and it uh, it helps meet the needs of the Arts Council, DECAL, Belfast City Council and the other sponsors, and we, we do attract the rest of the support from the the, the, the executive then that's the way to go forward. But my, under, but my clear uh, intention was that we don't need a short gap to be here next year. I don't think that's fair on the orchestra. I don't think it's fair on the Arts Council or Belfast City Council or indeed the other sponsors. And I don't think it's fair to the public who do have a lot of loyalty for the, the orchestra, want to see it working, want to see it thriving and surviving. But it is my job to make sure that it is a model that can stand up to scrutiny and it will have the economic sustainability that no one paid attention to in previous years. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I add my voice to the Save the Ulster Orchestra campaign and welcome the investment from Belfast City Council? And can I uh, seek the assurances of the Minister that she will do all she can uh, to ensure that the orchestra will not be reduced in size to a, a chamber orchestra as part of any uh, funding model that she may be able to award? I can't give guarantees about what 
the size of the orchestra will be or what it may or not, may not be reduced to. I understand that the Ulster Orchestra Programme Management Board will be bringing a few suggestions, a few proposals onto the model, and I think it would be foolhardy for me to say I will support A, B, C or D without even having seen them first, and I am sure the member can appreciate that. But, but I think we need to ensure that we do our best, effort, have our best efforts and put our best feet forward to make sure we do everything we can to try and make sure the, or, the Ulster Orchestra is sustainable. So it's on the basis of what we have and what we expect to be brought forward and what support we can get that we can actually sustain it in future years. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Ulster Orchestra is um, uh, a an orchestra which is highly respected throughout the world and is a leader in many respects. Uh, will the Minister uh, reassure the House that uh, in the event of there being an ultimate crisis which might see the orchestra gone, uh, actually go out of business, that the Minister will in fact provide the necessary funding given the fact that every substantial orchestra throughout the world is supported by public funds. I think the member is asking me to give guarantees that I'm not in a position to give. And certainly we've received, I mean, the orchestra in itself has and does cost a lot of money from the public purse. Uh, it will cost money in the future from the public purse. I'm not saying it shouldn't. But certainly the way it is currently, even the orchestra would say itself, it's unsustainable. That, that has come from the Ulster Orchestra itself. What we need to do is get an orchestra that it is fit for purpose, that it will have a better economic security going into the years ahead. And that for us will mean that we'll have an orchestra that we're all very loyal and proud of. It will also mean that it will provide inspiration and aspiration to young musicians coming forward, and there will be employment. But I think it is foolish to give guarantees at this position that I can't give just to be politically popular. Call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, and I also had heard that the um, new operating model had been prepared. But I'm wondering, uh, Minister, in your own budget, you obviously have a, a certain amount set aside under your own discretion for prioritisation. Can you indicate if there's any money in that there that might give the orchestra at this stage a bit of hope? I know we can't tie you down to it, but there is hope from DECAL. Well, any discretionary money I had was very, very small. I mean, we wouldn't even be seeing the Ulster Orchestra. And what I made a decision to, to invest that small discretionary money into disability, uh, particularly arts and performance for children who were severely disabled, and I make no apologies for that. You're talking about £25,000 here, £10,000 here, nothing over £50,000 at one time, particularly in relation to plays that actually for, were for children and young people who were so furthest removed from services. I don't think anybody, I'm not even suggesting the member would argue that that was not the thing to do. The Ulster Orchestra needs hundreds of thousands of public pounds of public money. I don't have that amount of money, land service in my department. Um, but certainly, as I've said, and I'm sure the member's been here when I've said it, I am waiting on the sustainable model being brought, brought, brought forward by the end of this week. When I read it and have discussions with my colleagues in the Arts Council and Belfast City Council and the sponsors and my executive colleagues first and foremost, it's only then I make a decision or a recommendation to them if I'm satisfied that the model that they're bringing forward is what we need for the future. Call Mr Jimmy Spratt for a question. <coughs> question 7, uh, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for his question. The impact of the draft budget for 2015 and 16 will not be unique to the arts sector. All service areas across my department and indeed its arm's length, arms length bodies have been impacted by recently announced budget reductions. Decisions on how budget reductions are managed is a matter in the first instance for the boards and the senior management and I have asked that the Arts Council does all it can to minimise the impact of the reductions on jobs and frontline services. Work on developing savings plans is continuing and my department intends to publish a more detailed assessment of the like likely impacts by the closing of the draft budget at the end of November this year. Mr Spratt for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, can I ask the Minister, is there any likelihood that some of the budgets for this financial year uh, could in fact uh, be reduced, given that they are paid out normally, I think, quarterly? Uh, is there any likelihood that some of those budgets could actually be uh, have percentage reductions? 
Well, the member may be aware, initially, my, all the departments were looking, most of them were looking at 15%, then it went down for decal, it went down to 12.8%, and then it went down to 10%. Uh, I made a decision to try and protect as best possible libraries at anything from 7.5 to 8%, which had a knock-on effect on the other ALBs. In this case, at the minute, it's sitting at 11.2%, and I appreciate that is a substantial amount of money to re be removed from the, from the sector. But at the end of the day, that's a decision I've made. I'm obviously going to lobby and fight for more money, particularly around the arts that have a far reach within communities who have never experienced arts before. That is the priority I'm going to set. But there's no point in saying anything different because I'm at the podium. And you can get away perhaps with saying some things at question time that do not stand over outside this house. What I'm saying here is what I've said and will say after. Mr. Fergal McKinnon. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I, can I just extend that point? So, uh, in recognition of the deeper impact that particular types of arts activity can have on community and health and well-being, what assessment is being made of those extra benefits with a view to arguing and mitigating against the cuts? Well, certainly, I, as the member will be aware, that DECAL produced a new revised business plan and set out a list of key priorities in conjunction with the priorities that we, as an executive, set out for the programmes for government. I also asked all the arms land bodies, particularly arts, libraries, museums and sports, to try and make sure that the budgets that they have at the minute, and certainly additional monies that some have received through monitoring rounds, that they met as best possible those objectives and those priorities. And that's to make sure that people who were never in the funding cycle, who were never in the annual supported programmes, who have never had an opportunity who do good work out, work out there, who have never been supported by Arts Council ever before, get support. And I want to make sure that happens. I make absolutely no apologies for that. Oh, Mr. Cattle Boylan. Margaret, the last time, Carla Agus, going break, is Slash Nair, as Dr. Agra. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm going to thank the Minister for her answers. But could I ask the Minister why, why is there a need for a new arts strategy, particularly in light of recent budget constraints? Coramil Margaret. Well, first of all, there is no overarching body, or no overarching arts strategy in the same way we've got the Sports Matters strategy, which overarches all the departments, with all the departments have taken part in. There's a budget aligned against it, and certainly um, that is the direction travel I want to go to with arts. I believe the fact that there hasn't been an overarching strategy actually hasn't given value to it. Uh, I also am appreci I appreciate that the strategy, which is lar largely delivered, uh, particularly around improved arts infrastructure that has been invested in here, needs to also include the diversity we have, particularly in terms of accessibility and education. Uh, so it is, and it has been my ambition, and certainly my strategic direction, that we need to have a fuller, more robust strategy for the arts to ensure that it enjoys the full support of the executive and to ensure that it enjoys the full support of the community. And we will begin out the consultation very soon in that. Call Mrs. Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. In Northern Ireland, um, we already get much less at, uh, public arts funding per head compared to the rest of the UK. Um, there has been clear evidence of the economic benefits in investing uh, in the arts sector. Can I ask the Minister, um, has she done any assessment uh, in f if, if there is going to be further cuts on the arts sector, what negative impact it may have on our population? Well, I, I would agree with the member that um, we need to try and increase the amount that's spent here per week per capita in comparison uh, to other institutions. I certainly have felt that the money set aside for arts over a period of years isn't enough. But I've also, from coming into the office, pleaded with people in the arts sector um, who sometimes haven't understood what I've been trying to say. I knew this day was going to come. I pleaded with people in the arts sector to actually show the value of their work <coughs> in terms of how it does regenerate the economy, how we cannot have a life without arts and culture, activity and creativity. And we do need to have more money in the arts. And I will continue to stand up for arts and increased investment. I have made a decision in this uh, proposed monitoring round and budget, sorry, draft budget, to ensure that as best possible libraries are protected for permanent closure in this budget round. But that's not to say that I won't argue for additional money for arts. I continue to do that. 
Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We are now going to move on to topical questions. And before I call Mr Sammy Douglas, can I remind members that Deputy Speaker Roy Beggs this morning made a plea for no private conversations, particularly when ministers are ans answering questions. So I call Mr Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And could I ask the Minister if she could give the House an update on the redevelopment of Windsor Park, please? Well, I'm, like the member, probably have driven down Broucher Road and I'm delighted to see O'Hara McGovern's hoarding right round it and, to see, and del actually delighted to see the, the dirt tracks on the Broucher Road, which shows there's a lot of activity in terms of construction. Windsor Park's due, on, and it's, it's due uh, on, it's on target. All the construction elements have been met as per target, even with some set, setbacks, particularly around the, the asbestos, but everything's on target. Uh, I'm delighted to say that working uh, particularly with the IFA and this capital bill programme has been uh, as, it, as it should be. And I'm sure the member and other members will be aware that not just the social clauses pre-construction, uh, we're now working on the social clauses post-construction. So on target and actually just slightly in advance. Call Mr Douglas for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And could I thank the Minister um, for her, her answer? Uh, the Minister will, will be aware of some re recent difficulties in terms of car parking at Raven Hill or Kingspan. Um, so would she be in a position to outline the plans for parking um, in the vicinity of Windsor Park, not just for the spectators, but also for the local residents as well? Well, I, I think I, I know that uh, when the planning permissions were awarded, certainly that parking was certainly a big element in that. But notwithstanding that, these stadia have to be good neighbours with people who have lived there a lot longer than the, 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 the stadia programmes. Um, and it is important that we use I mean, things like public transport, park and ride, uh, are, are now being developed, certainly in partnership with TransLink, to ensure that local residents aren't put off um, or, or inconvenienced any more than they need to be. There's certainly more parking space available at Windsor Park than what there is at Ravenhill, uh, so that's an added bonus. But certainly, certainly it's a built-up uh, community that needs to be respected. and the. The Irish Football Association need to work very, very closely with their friends and neighbours to ensure that inconvenience is reduced as much as possible when the stadium actually is finished and opened up to the public. I call Mr. Leslie Cree for a topical question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, uh, you'll be aware of financial transactions, capital, an important part that that plays. We have some 35 million unallocated this year. I'm wondering, has your department been able to use any of that source of revenue? Well, certainly my, my officials have been working very closely with the Department of Finance and Personnel. Um, I mean, any capital projects that we have, we would certainly would make a bid for them unless they're shovel ready. Uh, and certainly I'm doing an assessment as part of the draft budget discussions around what capital projects would certainly be ready to try and spend some money, albeit small amounts of money, before uh, the end of the financial year. Um, but at this stage, we're still in negotiations, or still not negotiations, but discussions uh, around capital projects with the Department of Finance and Personnel, and also with Sport and I, Arts Council and any the rest. But the member will know, even through the committee, what capital programmes were brought forward in monitoring rounds, because there's no point in bidding for it. I have to hand it back again. Mr. Cree for supplementary. Thanks, Deputy, and I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, I know that most departments are a little bit um, cautious about trying to work, because you have to work with the private sector to lever this. But uh, could I ask her, just following on her response, um, has she ch um, charged anyone in her department to actually liaise with the private sector to see, in fact, whether it could be common ground and to utilise this asset? Well, I'm certainly working with um, the SIB. Um, who have, have liaisons with the private sector um, and indeed the voluntary and community sector around potential investment, and not just potential investment but future programming, certainly working with the SIB with the Stadia programme and indeed uh, the TBUC programme, but happily looking out for other opportunities. I mean, we've had discussions with this, the councils in particular around different aspects of investment that we can do in partnership, and some of that may mean you know, putting spent money up front in order to leave other monies. I'm totally open to that, but I want to do it on the basis that it's been properly assessed and probably evaluated, and only then I make a bid for something that will not be handed back at another monitoring round. 
Call Mr. Mike Nesbitt for topical question. Speaker, thank you. May I ask the Minister whether any of the relevant authorities have any outstanding uh, issues with regard to the health and safety matters uh, regarding the design of the new stadia at Windsor Park, Casement Park and Ravenhill? Well, certainly, um, I can't comment on Casement Park because it's subject to a, a legal proceeding at the moment. There's a, a judicial review has been heard and waiting on the judgment. But certainly, I haven't, I haven't heard of any health and safety issues in relation to Windsor Park or indeed Ravenhill Kingspan. Um, had there been health and safety issues brought, that would be brought forward to me, I have a very, very good working and open relationship with both sporting bodies. And had there been any uh, particular issues that would have been brought forward to me well before now. For supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Minister. Can I ask her then, what, what are the evacuation times for the three stadia and how do they compare to safe standards? Well, I'll happily write to the member in terms of um, the evacuation procedures and the standards, but the member should be aware the plan permission wouldn't be given to any of them unless that the access and egress standards were not only met, but certainly went further than that. That's a criteria. That's not something you might want to do or you might want to think about. It's something that has to happen. So if there's any particular interest or any particular issue that the member has in relation to other two stadia, I would expect them to bring forward to my attention and indeed bring it forward to the governing body's attention. And if not, certainly bring it forward to the Belfast City Council who have responsibility for the health and safety certificates that each of the sports grounds have received. Call Mr Cahill O'Shea for a topical question. Uh, I'm to ask him, sure, that, can I ask the Minister outline how she intends to protect uh, libraries from permanent closure uh, during the current uh, budget, please? Well, going by his label, um, as, as Kesha Corum. Um, well, as I outlined, I think it was in relation to Jimmy Spratt's primary question, I made a decision in this uh, certainly this draft budget period uh, to protect libraries as much as possible from permanent closure. Uh, that, is something, that is something that I have decided to do. We have invested in libraries quite heavily. I have personally went and lobbied other ministerial colleagues to provide service level agreements to provide sustainability, particularly for people who live in rural communities. Libraries are a vital source uh, of an infrastructure and investment for those communities, and it's important we keep them um, open. So it's to that end, and that's the reason why I want to make sure that there are no permanent closures in this budget period. Call Mr. Washington for supplement. Uh, I've got the last thing, Cordy, I've got to go and waste the Naira, and I thank the Minister very much for her answer, and I'm sure many neighbours will be very glad to hear that reply that there will be no permanent closures. In saying that, uh, how will she ensure and how will she work with Libraries NI to ensure a minimisation of the impact of shorter hours, opening particularly in rural areas? Well, um, I will meet and have met with Libraries NI, and certainly we'll be meeting with them over the next uh, period of time. Our officials, as a member, will not be surprised, but I'm working very closely with all the ALBs, and particularly around the Chief Executive uh, of Libraries NI, to ensure we have uh, received uh, word that there potentially may be some that faced uh, a reduction in the opening hours, but we're trying as best possible to minimise those reductions. The important thing is to make sure there are no permanent closures, and we have achieved that for this budget period, but it's still very much work in progress in relation to reduction in opening hours. Call Mr Nelson McCausland for a topical question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Equality is one of the core principles espoused by the Minister in her department. Would she therefore take the opportunity today to distance herself from and repudiate the foul-mouthed statement by Gerry Adams that equality is simply a tactical Trojan horse to break the unionist community and to undermine Northern Ireland? Well, first of all, I thank you for brass neck. Uh, slapping my wrist or anybody else's wrist over equality because you and your colleagues uh, um, have, have, Minister, have a very, Minister, very. Could you make the remarks through the chair, please? Sorry, have a very, very short memory, but I don't. First of all, my party colleague and my party president has apologised. And unlike your colleague, unlike your colleague, Gregory Campbell, who has never apologised for the offence that he caused to the Irish language. Equality is something for everyone. It's for all the children of this nation, not just Catholic or Protestant or Unionist or Republican. It's for, for us all. And that's something I'll do and continue to do and make no apologies for it. Before a call for the supplementary, can remind everyone 
Remarks must be made through the chair, and it is not customary to be reading questions. Mr. Deputy Speaker, could I say to the Minister then that on this occasion, perhaps it is rather the case that Mr. Adams was actually being truthful, was speaking from the heart, and that it was simply the fact that his mask slipped on this occasion. Would the Minister not accept that's really the case, that he was simply caught on, found out, and had to own up? Uh, well, first of all, I'm assuming from the member's questions that he hasn't accepted Jerry Adams' apology for the mm. language that he used. Uh, I've yet to hear an apology from Gregory Campbell. In fact, I've yet to hear an apology from anybody on the members' benches about the disgraceful remarks they made around the Irish language and the offence he caused. You know, it is not slapdash comedy to be Islamophobic or homophobic or against the Irish language. And I've yet to hear an apology. What I've heard from your benches are excuses which fall far short of the standards that we're all expected to adhere to in this assembly. So, People in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Shane. Can I remind members, I don't think I need any help from the benches now to chair this meeting. And I did say before, remarks from a senator position will not be toler tolerated by any deputy speaker. I now call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, would the Minister agree that community arts are, are vital to creativity, jobs, community cohesion, civic participation and economic growth in Northern Ireland, uh, despite uh, Northern Ireland having the lowest spend on arts across UK and Ireland? Uh, um, can I ask the Minister, does she agree that the uniform budgetary reductions being applied uh, to the arts sector could have a, a devastatingly disproportionate impact on that sector for years to come? Well, the member was in the House when he heard other uh, members ask me questions, particularly in relation to the, the budgets around um, decal, the decal families, and particularly around arts. And I am very, very supportive of arts. But it is unfair, it's hugely unfair, that year on year, year that we're given a reduced budget from the British government by a cabinet of millionaires who are Tories, who don't value the services here in the north of Ireland, don't value the services, not only can we do in this part of the island, but across the island, and it is going to have an impact. I want to ensure that the most adverse of that impact is felt less by services who deliver within the community and for the community and create employment. I can't do anything else other than that. Call Mr Little for supplement. Thank the Minister for her response and, and note that she's made reference to the UK Government, but can the Minister give us a bit more detail on what she's doing within the Northern Ireland Executive to stand up for community arts? And indeed, would the Minister join me in uh, congratulating the success of the C.S. Lewis Community Festival that took place in East Belfast this weekend and, and advise the House on how she can support that festival going forward? Um, well, the, the members' last two points certainly congratulate the C.S. Lewis Festival, certainly working with these side arts. They're, they're a pleasure to work with, I have to say. Uh, certainly happy to do that. I just find it a bit rich. You know, the members' sister party over in England is part of a, a Tory-led government who's yielding cuts all over the place. So agree to do it, and it's OK to do it in London, but not do it here. I mean, the party needs to make its mind up. I know it's about revenue raising, which is for me shorthand about water charging. I know it's about revenue raising, which is shorthand for prescription charges and charging for student fees. But as long as the art sector gets it, which, which is it? You can't have it all. What we're trying to do, but on the record for, is protect those who are most affected and most vulnerable. And that's communities who are extremely deprived. And I continue to do that and make absolute, absolutely no apology for it. I call Mr. Colum Eastwood for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, can the, the Minister detail, uh, give us a detailed breakdown of how the money that she received in October monitoring for City of Culture Legacy funding will be spent? I'm happy to write to the member on that. Uh, I've written to the member before. I've corresponded with the member through various questions. Certainly working through some of that with the, the partnership around the City of Culture Legacy funding, but certainly happy to write to the member with details. Order. Time is up.